Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Timothy. We're going to be in chapter 1 this morning in verses 18 through 20. Just three verses this morning, but they're three powerful verses. Now, as you remember, the books of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus are called the pastoral epistles. This is our study. It's a study through the pastoral epistles, and they're called that because they're written to Timothy, who was the pastor of the church in Ephesus, and Titus, the pastor of the church on the island of Crete. Now, the theme of 1 Timothy and for the pastoral epistles is church order. And the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, wanted to instruct Timothy and Titus, uh, these two young pastors, in the proper teaching on church order. Uh, and for that, that doctrine, that teaching to be passed on down through the generations, generation to generation, as it is to this very day. And Paul used that word, he used that word doctrine nine times in 1 Timothy, four times in 2 Timothy, and four times in Titus for a total of 17 times in these three books. Doctrine was an important uh, issue for Paul. Um, by the way, don't let the word doctrine scare you. Doctrine simply means teaching. And in this sense, teaching from the Word of God, teaching from Scripture, teaching what God has to say, you see. That's what doctrine means. Now, the early beginnings of, of some heresies had already started, even in Paul's day. And so Paul wanted to ensure that sound doctrine was communicated. Unfortunately, some of those uh, false teachings, some of those heresies are, are still around today. And so we need to stand firm on sound doctrine even today after all these centuries. As we learned in the first 17 verses of this chapter, some were teaching fables, that is fiction, as if it were God's word. A fake account such as the Apocrypha had been in circulation in the Old Testament times, and new works were being written in New Testament times by men whom Paul calls men of corrupt minds. Others were teaching, it's, it's told us, endless genealogies, lists of ancestors and ancestries and spiritualizing all of that. And it was a distraction to God's word. Others were teaching, as we learned last week, wrong doctrine concerning the law of Moses and its purpose. They taught that you could be saved by keeping the law, even though scripture declares in Romans 3 that none can keep the law perfectly. And that the law's purpose was to expose our sin, not to heal our sin. Amen? Amen? The law's purpose is it exposes our sin. It reveals that we can't keep the law. The standard is so high that each and every one of us finds ourselves a sinner in need of a Savior. That's the purpose of the law. But, but they were teaching wrongly about the law. Teaching that you can actually be saved by keeping the law. Even though no one can keep the law. Jesus heals us of our sin, amen? 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 Not the law. And all of these, all of these, as I mentioned, had no foundation in the Word of God, no foundation in Scripture. They only served as a distraction to those who were caught up in them. And they are likewise a distraction for some today. They take away from godly edification by faith, which comes only by the Word of God. The key scripture for these epistles is 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3, verse 14. Paul says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So Paul's purpose in writing uh, these epistles is to ensure good church order by way of sound doctrine, which then leads to Godly living, right living, you see. So if you're not already there, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, as we continue to look at the church and its message. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, 
according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So Paul gives Timothy a charge, a mandate to keep. That mandate is found back in verse 3. Paul told Timothy, said, Remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, no doctrine different than what Paul and the apostles have already been teaching. Now the word commit uh, is a word that means to deposit something. Uh, so Paul had deposited, you see, in Timothy the truth of God. And he expected Timothy to ensure that truth was passed on faithfully. This was his mandate. This was his charge. Apparently, Timothy was also prophesied over concerning his ministry. And Paul reminds him of those prophecies so that they would be an encouragement to him during the difficult days ahead. And also that, that, that he could be reminded uh, about those prophecies that they might direct his ministry as well. You know, in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says, uh, says this. It says, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. And even in the New Testament, we find that God, by the Holy Spirit, through the gift of prophecy, was leading and directing the activities of the church and of individuals in the church, such as Timothy and even the Apostle Paul. It was Ananias uh, to whom the Lord revealed by the prophetic word his plan for Saul who became the Apostle Paul. In Acts 9.15 we read this, But the Lord said to him, that's to Ananias, he said, Go, for he, that is Paul, is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. God spoke this prophetic word through his servant Ananias concerning Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, and concerning his future ministry. He would be, bear the name of the Lord before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. We later find Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, sent out on their first missionary journey by the direction of the Holy Spirit and doubtless by the prophetic word that was uttered. It, as we read, it says, uh, as they, the church, ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Anybody ever hear the Holy Spirit speak audibly? Anybody here? So how does the Holy Spirit speak? How do you think he spoke in this, time, in this instance? Well, he spoke through someone in the church who had the gift of prophecy, right? That's how he sent Paul and Barnabas out, through that prophetic word. In Acts chapter 20, verses 22 and 23, as Paul is on his way to Jerusalem, he says this, he says, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Now, again, how did the Holy Spirit testify in every city? If you go back to the book of Acts, you find that, that God's prophets came and spoke this word over the apostle Paul. So the prophetic word was spoken to Paul as he traveled to Jerusalem to prepare him for what lay ahead in Jerusalem. Well, how does God speak to us today? Because, by the way, today we are still in New Testament times. And the things that I read to you were all happening in New Testament times. Well, the primary means God speaks to us today is by His Word. But just as we see in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament, He also speaks by way of the prophetic Word. It was this prophetic word that God had spoken through those with the gifting of prophecy to young Timothy. And Paul, that, that Paul mentions here. He reminds Timothy that his ministry and calling were according to the prophecies previously made concerning you. Now some may contend that God no longer speaks like this today. But I would argue from the word of God that the gifts of the Spirit including the gift of prophecy, are very much alive and should be a part of the church today. However, I want to say this. The true 
gift of prophecy and the prophetic word will never, ever be in conflict with the revealed word of God. Amen? God, the Holy Spirit just does not contradict himself, right? So it will never be in conflict with the word. That's why this is called the canon of scripture. That word canon means ruler. And, and, and it's a measure, right? It's what you measure stuff with a ruler. So we measure, in a sense, any utterance of prophecy, any prophetic word, any word that somebody gives you, you measure that by the standard, by the ruler, by the canon, by God's word. You take it back to the word. Is it in accordance with God's word? You know, it was after 17 years of failed ministry that a 30-something-year-old pastor at a prayer meeting one evening, sat down before the people, and he asked for prayer for himself. He was defeated. He was feeling the pains of years of fruitless labor. Through the prophetic word, the Lord revealed that he was going to make this man, this defeated man, a shepherd of shepherds. That man was Pastor Chuck Smith, the founding pastor of the Calvary Chapel movement and a key leader of the last great revival in America called the Jesus Movement. Thousands of men came out of that movement and specifically out of Calvary Chapel to shepherd churches across the world. That was in result of the, the prophetic words spoken over Pastor Chuck those many years ago. And Pastor Chuck became the shepherd of over 3,000 churches worldwide. And one of the largest churches in the world and possibly even in the history of the world. There are some estimates that over 70,000 people called Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa their home church at one time uh, before Pastor Chuck went home to be with the Lord. Now does God still speak to us in prophecy today? Yes, yes. I could even and will cite examples in my own life of fulfilled prophecy. In 1978, the Lord revealed to me that I would one day, and this is 1978, that I would one day be standing in a small community in the mountains pointing people to Jesus. And here I am. Thank you, Lord. That was 1978. In 1989, a pastor, uh, in the middle of his sermon at a small four-square church that Diane and I were attending at the time, this pastor, in the middle of his sermon, stopped his sermon, walked to the front, pointed to me in the audience and said, you, I sense God is calling you to be a leader in the church. I thought he was talking to the fellow. I turned around. I thought he was talking to the fellow behind me. God directs the activities of the church and of individuals at times by the prophetic word. This is what Paul is referring to here with Timothy. Paul also commands Timothy to wage the good warfare. That is to conduct his offense, uh, his campaign, his work for the Lord based on the prophecies previously made concerning him. In other words, remember Remember what the Lord has spoken about your life and ministry and get after it. Get after it. Wage the good warfare, he tells Timothy. At some point in young Timothy's life, there were certain prophecies made concerning him and possibly his ministry for the Lord. And Paul reminds him of these. These were to encourage Timothy and to direct Timothy in his work for the Lord. You know, it was the fall of 1982. I was living up in North Idaho. Uh, a broken and defeated fella. Previously, I was enrolled at Calvary Chapel Bible College uh, and had even attended the first school of ministry uh, put on by Pastor Chuck at Costa Mesa back in 1979. But at that time in my life, I was a broken down and defeated young man. Well, there was an older brother. His name was Larry Ranville. And, and he needed help one Saturday pulling some stumps from his property up in North Idaho. And some of the brothers from church, uh, Calvary Chapel, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and myself, we went over to help pull stumps. 
Well, as we're working, as we're sweating, uh, just helping Larry out, all of a sudden Larry turns to me out of the blue. He just turns and looks at me and he, he quotes Joel 2.25 and he says, and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten and the canker worm and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And then Larry just turned around and went back to pulling stumps. I, on the other hand, was standing in shock because I, I, I sensed the word of God speaking to my heart, the prophetic word. And I took that word and I hid it in my heart. And in difficult times, I've looked back on that word and I continued to press on knowing that God had promised to restore me, you see. The very next verse in Joel reads this. It says, and ye shall be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. My people shall never be ashamed. Now one last comment on this is that in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, the Bible says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I share that so that you won't be confused about what it means when God speaks to you prophetically. And in the case I cited in my own life, God confirmed what he was going to do in my life by an example in his word. But that does not mean that God wrote that word specifically for me. You get it? It didn't have anything to do with me when he originally wrote it. It just, he took it and used it and applied it to my life, you see. That's how that works. So back in our verse, Paul reminds young Timothy of those prophecies. And it may be, as many have suggested, that Timothy as a young man was a little timid and he needed the encouragement and the direction that those prophecies would bring to him. As he would look back to the, the promises and prophecies God made concerning him, he may have then been able to draw strength, uh, to draw courage, to draw direction from them. Paul's goal was that by them, that is, Tim, uh, by them, you, that's speaking to Timothy, that you may wage the good warfare. You know, Paul often saw things in either military or athletic terms. He saw the Christian life as a race, as a boxing match, and as warfare. Look now at verse 19. Having faith and a good conscience, from which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. So we're to wage the good warfare by faith and a good conscience. God desires that we walk by faith. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, the Bible says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And Paul encourages Timothy to have faith, to trust the Lord. And I think this is in reference to the prophecies previously made. Have faith, trust what God has told you. Believe what God has told you. What Timothy could see with his own eyes by his sight told him one thing. But faith tells a different story. It tells the story of hope, of salvation, and of a kingdom to come, which we have not yet seen, but we believe. And Timothy needed to believe those things. He needed to believe the things that God had revealed to him about his own life and about his ministry for the Lord. Hebrews 11.7 says this, it says, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Noah was warned, warned of something he had never seen before. In fact, warned of something no one had ever seen before. We read in the book of Genesis that water had come up from the, the ground and watered the face of the earth. It was like a giant greenhouse situation. It had never rained before. And God told Noah it was going to rain. Something he had never seen before. Something no one had ever seen before. We likewise have been warned. 
The world has been warned, warned of a coming judgment that will try the whole earth and all who dwell on it. By faith, we can see beyond that. By faith, we see that the kingdoms of this world have an end. We see that there is coming a kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that will never end. So see, so often we're short-sighted, aren't we? We're short-sighted. We just see what's in front of us, and we fail to look with eyes of faith. Stretch your eyes out by faith to see what God has promised you in his word. And then you can endure the temporary setbacks, temporary difficulties, temporary failures that you may experience in this life. Peter said in 2 Peter 3.11, he said, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, the things that we're looking at right now, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So Paul encourages Timothy and us to have faith. And the second thing he encourages Timothy in is a good conscience. This means that if we are to wage a good warfare, then we must first be right with God in our conscience. How can we tell the world the perils of sin, which is destruction, if we ourselves are living in sin, you see? We cannot preach against drinking if we are drinkers, we cannot preach against adultery if we are living in adultery. We cannot preach against the sin of lust if we are going to see movies that we ought not to go see. A bad conscience will lead to compromise in doctrine, which in turn will lead to wrong living. Someone said it this way. They said, when morals slip, doctrine ebbs and the fight is soon lost. They also said this, they said a good conscience is the mother of a sound faith and the wherewithal to fight the good fight. Amen? Amen. Now Paul also tells us that there are some, some in, in Ephesus in this regard who do not have faith or a good conscience. In fact, they've rejected the faith and the need for a good conscience. Paul tells us that uh, because of this, they're shipped. Their ship is on the rocks. Their ship is going down. He says, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. What they rejected was the need for a good conscience. They thought they could live in sin and everything was okay. If we think we can live any way we like, contrary to the word of God, then we're headed for shipwreck. We're headed for a disaster. The Bible so clearly tells us in Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Rejecting the faith and a good conscience is sowing to the flesh and it leads to both corruption and eventual shipwreck. A disaster awaits those who reject God's way. Now he gives us a couple of people who are examples of this disaster. Look at verse 20. Of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Here Paul names two men. How would you like to have your name in the Bible in a bad context? Like, this is the wrong, this guy's doing wrong. I don't want my name in there, right? So Paul names two guys who have rejected the faith and rejected a good conscience. One is a guy by the name of Hymenaeus, who is also mentioned in 2 Timothy 2.17, along with another fella uh, named Philetus. And the other man is named Alexander. Uh, he might also be the, the same man mentioned in 2 Timothy 4.14, uh, where Paul says this. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. It might be that fellow that Paul's referring to here. We're told in 2 Timothy 2.18 the exact nature of one of the errors of Hymenaeus. It says there, it says, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, 
and they overthrow the faith of some. So this man's error was to spiritualize the resurrection of the dead, to claim that it had already occurred. And this may have been one of the earliest forms of Gnostic heresy to invade the church. In fact, Paul calls this error in 2 Timothy 2.16, he calls it profane and idle babblings. This was a serious doctrinal error. They had strayed, you see, from the literal interpretation of the resurrection to a spiritual interpretation, an allegorical interpretation. Their error was so serious that we read in 2 Timothy uh, 2.18, uh, they overthrow the faith of some. They were stumbling the saints by teaching this error. And Paul's solution was to deliver these men to Satan. And, and this may be uh, a, a simple euphemism uh, for excommunication. Or it may have been a more severe apostolic uh, deliverance to Satan. Uh, some form of uh, disease or affliction that Paul called down upon these men. Or it could be both. It is clear from the text that Paul is cutting these men off from the body of Christ. So that number one, they could do no more harm to the saints. And number two, so that they could learn a lesson. That they may learn not to blaspheme. You see, even in the extreme case of excommunication... The goal is always correction. The goal is always uh, restoration, you see. It's not just punishment, okay? But it's that they may learn a lesson from this. Now, this ends our first uh, section of the outline in 1 Timothy, the church and its message. And that message, that message is sound doctrine. We must hold on to the truth that comes from God's word. And resist those distractions, resist those false teachings that are in conflict with God's word. You know, and, I, and you've heard me say this before, but read your Bible. Your Bible is the best inoculation you can have against false doctrine. Amen? Amen. If you know the truth of God's word, then you'll recognize those things that aren't in agreement with God's word. And, and that's as simple as it is. Read your Bible. Read it today. Read it tomorrow. Read it the next day. Read it every day. Read your Bible and you will know the truth. And, and when the error comes along, the Holy Spirit will remind you of those things that you know and, and you will recognize, hey, that's not right. That's not true. That's not what God's Word says. And so read God's Word. Know the truth. And you'll, you'll be inoculated against errors of false doctrine. You know, we, we still, even in this day, even after all the centuries since the apostles, we still must wage a good warfare. A good warfare against distractions and a good warfare against false teaching. And only God's word can create godly edification in our lives. Only God's word has the power to build up our faith, to encourage us in our faith, to strengthen us in our faith. These other things are just distractions, if not harmful to our faith. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. Father in heaven, once again, thank you for your word. It's a powerful word, just these short verses, Lord, and, the, and, and those things that you've spoken to us this morning. The reminder, Lord, of, of how you work in our lives, even through uh, the prophetic word, through the, the written word of God, and, and that in tandem with the Holy Spirit speaking the prophetic word to our hearts and lives through brothers and sisters over the years. God, you work in amazing, amazing ways. And we, we thank you for the amazing way in which you work. And we pray that you will continue to work in that way in our lives. As you said in your word, Lord, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So we thank you for the work that you're doing here. And now, God, we want to lift up, Lord, again, our community and pray for their safety, protection. Pray that, God, you would grant the firefighters uh, the ability to get the upper hand on these fires. Pray that you would keep each and every firefighter, a police officer, first responder safe. Pray for everyone's property and, and lives and, and, and livestock and animals and all.
God, we're praying for your protection for them. And, and in the midst of this storm, that you would stand up, Lord, and speak peace, be still to our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Let's all stand. Turn off this mic. Uh, thank you. Let's uh, let's sing Amazing Grace one last time. <coughs> To God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be dismissed. God bless you. And again, if something happens and uh, uh, you have a need because of the fire or whatnot, please give us a call. Let us know what your need is. God bless.